It is, it is pretty crazy. Only truck I could get is the slot lights at the uh, next to the house that before I get on the uh, I-10. Uh -huh. And even there, there's barely any cars now, right now. And that's next to a shopping mall. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of the the best we can get, right? Yeah, just five people. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, so it unnerves me. It's, I don't know what, what do I do for it, but I guess it, it makes me unnerved that it's going to be normal from now on. You know, it's, I didn't think that it was going to be this bad. I didn't either. I thought it would be more controlled by now, but. What? It was gonna take years? Years? Right. Now they say it's gonna be uh, like this into early uh, mid 2021, so. More than one year, yes. You know, they seem to be okay in Europe. Um, yeah. And in Africa? Europe has, has it starts starting containing it, but here we haven't even started. We just keep on climbing. Yeah. So. Why did you say yes? Well, because spring semester is not going to be back to normal, right? No, at the very earliest, uh, late summer of 2021, it's starting to get back to normal. At the earliest. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, because it started back in March, so next I mean, semester ends in May. I mean, I guess we'll have to remember that it started from the New York spread west and six years late, so. We got a cases here in March, uh, during that time, late March. pretty easy to control it, right? Just wear a mask. But then you get the stereotypical America people. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm afraid of telling people that they are supposed to wear clothing by law. <laughs> Otherwise they're gonna be like, oh no, why? But then they're gonna be completely cynical. Really? <laughs> Okay, um, let's see. So any questions about the homework? So that that one. One. Okay. Questions? It was pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. Um, so what did you get for the time? Let's say for the non, um, no, no, that's mystic. Okay. And, and for their relativistic? <laughs> yep. So, uh, so I guess these kind of supernova explosions, the uh, one uh, A occur pretty pretty quickly. So it's about a second. So the speed of sound, you know, it's an approximation because uh, really is the dp d rho. And 
this one is going to change like that. So it's not a constant. And over here is going to be close to zero. But you know, it's same order of magnitude, which is to the P over rho. Um, and I guess the other thing to that I wanted to point out with that homework is that as you increase the mass, the radius uh, decreases. And so if you plot the radius versus the mass, Goes kind of like that for the non relativistic, and then the relativistic is going to go, I think it goes kind of like that, like at 1.4 solar masses. Um, that's the Chandrasekhar limit, so it cannot be heavier than that, otherwise, it just explodes. Um, but you know, all, all the white dwarfs in between are kind of in this region between uh, the non-relativistic and their relativistic limits. And the other interesting thing about these uh, supernova explosions is that they always occur at the same mass. And so they always explode with the same, uh, I guess, release the same amount of energy. So they are used to, they're called like a, the standard candles or something. You can see them in the different galaxies and uh, you can, they have no hydrogen. They already burned all the hydrogen. So if you don't see hydrogen in the spectrum, uh, you know that it's, a, that it's a supernova type one explosion. Um, so you can use it for, uh, to determine the distance to that particular galaxy. Like uh, iron or the so more heavy metals? Yeah. Well, more metals. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell, like, just how the performance of the program that you'd like to Yeah, so. You know, the, the equation for the Chandrasekhar limit depends on mu. So from the spectrum, you can see what are the components. So you can estimate, you know, like if you say that you have, you know, an absorption line for, I don't know, um, calcium, and iron. So by looking at the relative peaks, you can see what is the composition. So you can estimate what was the mass. So you can know quite a bit of things or learn. Um, so the other, the other metric that is used to, uh, to, to find the, the distance you know, to, to galaxies, not really to nearby stars is by the Doppler shift of these uh, peaks. And, and we're gonna look a little bit at the Doppler shift today. So you can see the supernova explosion in some galaxy, and then you can look at the peaks from that galaxy um, to see what is the Doppler shift. And then you get a calibration between Doppler shift and distance. So then you can calculate the distance to other galaxies in which you have not observed um, supernova explosions. The other thing that I guess you should think about uh, is that there's also the supernova explosions produced by, um, by neutron stars. So not just by the white dwarfs. And those, I think, can have different uh, energies. Um, and I think there's going to be a paper on 
and kilonova explosions. Have you heard about those? Mm. So those are the ones that are, I think it was in, the, in that nucleosynthesis paper. Um, they're produced when you have a collision between white dwarfs or neutron stars. So, now we're going to look a little bit at binaries. As you can call it, binary systems. And as the name suggests, you have uh, two stars orbiting each other or orbiting their center of mass. So about half of the stars that you can observe uh, without aid, such as with your eyes, are binary systems. And the good thing about them is that you can learn by looking at their dynamics, you can find out what are the masses of the particular stars, which is kind of the only thing that you cannot learn from the spectrum. From the spectrum, you can get the, you know, you get the luminosity, you get the different um, elements that are present in the, in the cloud, but the mass, you cannot really get it independently. So, for this system, we have okay, a more massive star over here, uh, M2, and it's going to be vector X2. Then over here, we might have a lighter one. Doesn't really matter. M1, this is going to be longer. This is X1. And we're going to define a vector. This is a vector R that goes from one star to the other. So Going to be x1 minus x2. So m1, little m1, uh, little m2 are the masses of the two uh, stars. So the total mass, capital M. It's going to be M1 plus M2, total mass of the system. And so they are going to be orbiting their center of mass. So M1, X1, plus M2, X2 is going to be zero. And you can um, you know, apply, not apply, this uh, adapt this to any pair of, um, of um, particles or stars. So, origin and center of mass. This one? What, what is the question? Oh, sorry, there's, there's a two here. Um, that is just by definition. So you have, you say this is true. So this is this is the center of mass. You're the center of mass. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's circular. It is also the center of mass. Mm. 
Well, you're saying that you're defining the center of mass with this, but this is the definition of the center of mass. Um, right, so. This just comes from the definition of the radius. And so we can flip them. So just removing the negative there. And we can use this equation over here for x1. So then x1 is going to be minus m2 over m1. Then we can put this one over here and it will be one plus M2 over M1 times X2. Equals minus R. So this is just M1 plus M2 over M1, and this is the total mass. And so X2 is M1 over the total mass times the radius. Sorry, not the radius, the, the distance. And this is equation in Weinberg, 2.1.1. Mm, oh no, there should be a negative right there. Thank you. And so for x1, you can do the same thing. So x1 is going to be, that one is going to be positive. And two over M R. Right, so it is essentially your your weighted average of the mass. So you can express both x1 and x2 in terms of the uh, of the separation between the two bodies. So if the if the stars are not moving at a twisting speed, then you can use uh, Newton's second law. And this one we can express it in terms of R. Um, right? 
So for the two particles or two stars, I'm going to have M1 uh, second derivative of x1 with respect to your time equals what? Over the total mass? Over the total mass? Yeah. Is it more constant? Right. Do not get the the, the the derivative. Just tell me what is the, the nature of that force. Let's do the second law. What is creating that force? Oh, really? Really. So this is just this is it as a magnitude, so we don't get confused with the direction. So it's g m1 m2 over um, r squared. Right. So we can get rid of this mass, and so then the acceleration is g m2 over r squared. And this x1 uh, was in the positive direction. Right. x1 was like this. And r is in this direction. So what is the direction of this force? Centripetal? Mm -hmm. This is just like at, at one point. Do, do not consider that there's a, a velocity or anything. Just have two bodies separated by some distance and they have a gravitational attraction. Yeah, so just towards this side, right? So uh, it's going to be negative. And what is this? Yeah, okay. So, how do we express that this is a vector quantity? We have the negative there. Hmm? So, we could put it like this. Right. Like in the direction of R, um, we can also just make it a Q and put the radius vector up here. Right? Okay, let so me just rewrite it a little closer together. So that is the, the acceleration. I mean, Yes, it is the same thing. It's a, it's a different way of writing it. Should that be empty? Yes, we get rid of M1. So the other one. is going to be uh, positive because it's on this side of the center of mass. So being attracted in a positive direction. And that's going to be M1. OK, so those are the two the acceleration of the two bodies. So the derivative, second derivative with respect to time of 
of the radius is going to be, sorry, I keep saying the radius, the distance between these two bodies is x1 minus x2 vectors. And so we have each one of them. So this is going to be minus g m2 r over r cube uh, minus g m1 r over r cube and so we can just rewrite this one as G um, M um, oh, we have the name here. So M two uh, plus M one R vector divided by R cube. And this is the total mass. So GM R vector divided by R cube. Negative. So we um, we went from having equations for two bodies to having a, a putting everything is in a the one body situation with the radius um, r. Okay, so and this is your differential equation. So. So how do you solve that equation? It's really nasty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it looks very innocent. Um, it's actually pretty difficult. So, um, and we'll just go to the solution. The solution is pretty simple. So, <laughs> um, so the solution is R cosine of phi sine of phi zero. This is not quite a circle. So R is one minus E cosine of phi L over that. And I'm gonna go over what these things are. And the other thing that we're gonna need is the D phi dt, sorry, phi, d phi, is it phi or phi? Okay, it's g m over l cube one minus e cosine phi squared. So, E is the eccentricity and that you'll start to tell you what we're dealing with here. Um, L is the uh, 
semi-latest rectum and phi is the angle um, I guess I have to draw for this. So the equation that we had over here is called the 10 orbit equation. So you know it, it's uh, it's general if the eccentricity uh, well, this, this solution is for the case in which the eccentricity is between zero and one. So what is the eccentricity? So it is an ellipse. It is an ellipse, right? Yeah, but the sequence of the limit, I guess? Yes. It's the limit of an ellipse. I'm pretty sure it's nothing straight from here. It's going from one to one to zero. It's zero. One. One. Sorry, zero. The circle is zero, but it's the limit. You cannot reach it. It's the limit of the ellipse. And one, what will give you? A parabola. Okay. Yeah. So if you have like a, a cone, right? Hmm? Yes. So if it is uh, parallel to this, then you get the circle and then if you have an angle, you get the ellipse. And then uh, if the angle is large enough that it touches the end, then you just get like a part of that. Uh, and if it's perpendicular like this, then it is a uh, hyperbola. So for the parabola, you know, it's always like x squared times some stuff to make it um, narrower or, um, or wider. But this one is not x squared. Like the, um, the exponent's gonna be different. But yeah, so the, the eccentricity is between zero and one. So zero is a, is a circle. Um, one is close to a parabola. So the eccentricity is square root of one minus b squared over a squared. So here you're gonna have your um, major axis, it's going to be like this, and the minor axis. So this whole thing, the minor axis, is 2a, and this whole thing is 2b. Right, so um, in the case in which this goes to, well, this one goes to zero, what happens to the ratio between B and A? Yeah. So these two are the same size, right? And so you get your circle. So in the limit when D is close to one, then what can you do with B and A? Yeah, so A is close to infinity or B is close to zero, right? So in their case, you get very, very, very elongated. Um, 
figure. Huh? Yes. Uh, sorry, this is A. Major, minor. So there are a few other things that matter for um, ellipses or those elements. Foci? Yeah, for elements over here. Foci and well, the focus. So you have one over here. Another one over here. So this is the eccentricity. I'm going to explain the focus. Um, the other one, the latest rectum, is a one minus e squared. So it is. Uh, this one over here. So in the case of a circle, um, the eccentricity is going to be zero. So L is just equal to A. So it's just the radius. And A and B are the same. But as this becomes more elongated, then this L becomes uh, smaller. So what, what's the name of the uh, latest rectum? L-A-T-U-S uh, rectum. How are the focus defined? You can change the ratio of the distance to the circle. Yeah, so You have a line, which is called the directrix. It could be any line. And you find the point, it could be any point. We call it a focus. Well, it is a focus. And the um, ellipse is. the locus, so the set of points for which the distance to the directrix, it's called this, um, I don't know what notation to use, I'll just write it out, I'll spell it out. is the same as the distance to the focus times the eccentricity. So, If the eccentricity is zero, uh, the distance to here, the same distance is here, right? Right. 
So it will be like in between the focus and this one, you only have one focus in the ellipse, you will have two. So as it becomes less eccentric, um, they um, tend to be together. So in the limit, they are in the same place. And if the eccentricity is large, like 0.8 or something, then this one should look more like, like that. I guess it cannot be zero because then it's not defined, but it approaches that, it approaches zero. So you can imagine that there's like a lot of points over here. And then you look at each of them and you see if this condition is true and then you pick it if it is true and you don't if it, if it is not true. And that will give you a set of points that will draw the ellipse. So it depends on yeah, the, I guess the distance between the directrix and the focus and the eccentricity. So why do we care about these ellipses? I'm sure you can guess. I guess everything, right? Um, so all orbits are elliptic to to a certain extent. Um, let's see. So let's see this case. So when the eccentricity goes to zero, then L is approximately A, everything is a circle. And these two are equal. And the other case, when it is close to one, um, then I'm sure that circles exist in mass. I don't know that. Like, that probably depends on which field of math you are. And because you can uh, parameterize the, the circle, the sine and cosine. But probably if you go to like geometry, there should be someone to tell you that or an existing. But you know, I cannot, I, I don't know. I just know that you cannot have eccentricity equals to zero. No, equal to zero. Um, okay. So, so then if you have your your ellipse you have your uh, major, minor axis. So, the apostron is the uh, furthest point. So if you're talking about the sun and the earth, what will be, what will you call this one? The furthest point between the, uh, the earth and the sun. <laughs> that one is 
easy. And the other one, the shortest point, which will be over here. Um, Peria strong. In general, and if you want to call it, uh, and in, for the sun, uh, Earth system, this is a uh, perihelion. So helion, perihelion. Is that drawing is the center like the center of the center of gravity? It is the center of gravity. Um, which if you calculate it, I'm sure is inside of the sun. So this one is going to be, so it, you can define an angle and that angle is P. This is not the angle for like a, you know, like a circle. You can still define it. So um, this one happens at P equals zero. And this one happens at phi equals pi. Um, is it pi? And the maximum distance, R max, is going to be A uh, one plus E. So remember that this whole thing is two A, and the minimum. is A1 minus the eccentricity. Okay. Um, So, do you know what is the eccentricity of the, um, the uh, orbit of the Earth in India? I think it's 0.02. So it is almost zero. You're in front of your computer. What is the, look for the eccentricity of the Earth and Pluto? The reason one that has the most eccentric. So what happens to the, what, what is the, this is like a radial velocity. So it's a angle, it's a function of the time. Um, what is the radial velocity at the maximum? Sorry, the furthest. No, no, the closest. So phi equals pi. So 
So it is cosine of pi. Mm -hmm. L is the distance from the one of the foci to the locus. 0.25. Pretty eccentric. <laughs> So this is cosine, right? This will be zero. Um, this is pi. Mm. I think this should be pi over two. Right, because it's the 90 degree angle. Yeah. Yeah, because the more eccentric it is, the more it's going to vary the amount of energy that it receives from the star. So the seasons are going to be like crazy and things like that. Okay, so this should be pi over two. Why are you doing that? Hmm? Uh, that it should be pi over two, the furthest, uh, I mean the closest point. Otherwise, I said pi. It's, it's so this is the angle. So. What do you mean? Well, I don't know. Yes. So this one, this one is going to be zero at some angle, right? And that angle should be the ninety degrees. Why? This, this is just cosine. If I want my zero, like this. Your zero, so you have your ellipse. Yeah. And you have, this is the angle here. Yeah. So if the angle is zero. It does not generalize for any frame that No, I'm getting confused with what you're saying. And are you sure that the other point is fiber two? Fiber two is going to be the distance scale, right? So pi over two, you have this angle. It's going to be over here. Yeah, that's the distance L. Mm, no, the distance L. Oh, okay, okay. So you're not measuring with respect to the point. No, this is with respect to the center of mass. But yes, center of mass. Okay, so then zero is like like that. Yes. I can figure that it's going to be pi that's closer. Or is it the center of mass or the... So you're saying it's the other side? So I feel like the, the, the closest point... Is, is it the center of mass or is the focus? Um, no. Well... Yes, it is the same thing. It is the same thing, right? Yes. So you're saying when it's closest to focus, that's going to matter? Yes. Why are you saying that if you're focusing, you're having a good position there? Why are you saying that this point is the focus? That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. I'm not saying you're listening. So there's, let's get rid of this stuff. So do we agree that there is an angle for which that cosine is going to be zero? I mean, definitely, but this is going to be very one. Right, that is correct. That's what I was thinking. Usually, when you have this sort of measurement, you can have a phase distance that might be zero. Uh, I remember how we did it in analytical mechanics. So you just choose the easiest laws to be Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> That's it. 
<laughs> okay, the, the point here is that um, the velocity is different at different points. Right? You have uh, uh, the velocity is minimum when the distance is maximum, and is maximum when the distance is minimum between the two the, the two bodies. So, you know, if you look at some of the animations of like Pluto, for example, um, you know, there is moving really slowly over here, and then it moves up, and then it's slow, and then it goes fast. So, it depends uh, on the eccentricity, depends on the angle. Right. It, it is. It should be. I understand what you're saying. Right. Yeah, so it's positive for one and it's negative for the other one. Yeah, your, your, your whole expression. And so if E is close to zero, then it's always very similar. Or is the same. Okay. Um, does this make sense from the point of view of Newtonian mechanics? Q? No, this is phi. The angle. This is the angular velocity, yes. Um, does it make sense that it's different from the point of view of general gravitation? It's different without the orbit? Yes. Why? The acceleration, the acceleration is changing? Why? So the distance is changing, right? So your uh, angular velocity is changing. All right, uh, so the total energy it's going to be m1 x1 dot, so the time derivative over 2 plus m2 x2 dot over 2 minus g uh, m1 m2 mm, over r. So your potential energy, your kinetic energy, is the energy going to be positive or negative? Total energy. Hmm? Why? Mm -hmm. So if the kinetic energy is greater than potential energy, what happens? So you have that parabola, right? So the energy is going to be related to the eccentricity. And the angular momentum, and Weinberg uses J, which makes sense because L is the luminosity. Uh, so it's going to be M1 X1 uh, cross Mm. No, it's, it's R, R cross P, right? Oh, yeah, but in terms of X1. So the magnitude is going to be m1, m2, m1 plus m2, square root of gml, and the energy is going to be m1. 
one and two. So this is the reduced mass. Uh, it's going to be negative g two a. So l is the latest spectrum, and a is the um, semi-major axis. So. There are several kinds of binary systems. Hmm? Yes, you can write it in a different form. You can. So this one is the reduced mass, right? Uh -huh. And this one is the total mass, so it's a nice way, nice way to write. Um, okay, so the mo the, the most, mm, I guess, naive type of binary, the one that you, know, you just have two stars uh, that look close together. They might or might not be uh, actual binary stars. Then you have the the visual binaries. So for the visual binaries, you can see both of them uh, through, a, through a telescope. They are uh, far away from each other, that you know, they look like separate uh, points, and they are close enough to, to the Earth. So I think the most Famous case is uh, Sirius. You have the very bright star, and then you also have the, the white dwarf Sirius B. And then the next one is called um, they're called eclipsing binaries. It's called binary binary system. So, what do you think that? Um, they do the eclipse in one. So how will you be able to tell like if, if you're just receiving a signal? So that will be a visual, bi a visual binary. If you can uh, separate them, even if at some point, yes. So that would be like a combination, right? But if you can see when they're over here, like as two separate ones, they're they are visual. So these ones, you only see one dot, one point of, of light. Yeah. You will see. Right. So it, there's actually a, a better method. So these ones, mostly you will see a change of uh, luminosity. Um, but when you analyze their spectrum, they might have different elements or something. So you know that they are different uh, stars. So the one that can give you more information is called, well, they, they're called Spectroscopic um, binaries. There is a difference. So, if the if they are very close together, what do you expect that will happen to their their period? Very short, right? It could be many days or something. Um, these ones, you know, it could be months or years. So these ones, um, they're they're very short. So um, they're moving pretty fast uh, if their period is short. So what do you think will happen to their spectrum? 
Can I cover that? Yes. So uh, if they're moving, they don't even have to be moving that fast. You know? um, maybe like 1% of the speed of light, you're going to have a, a Doppler shift. Right? So if they are perfectly in your line of sight, then one star is going to be moving towards you and the other one away from you. So um, you should be able to see a blue shift in one of them and a red shift in the other. And those are like the ones that can give you the, the most information. When you're looking at the look like you actually see the blue shift. Yes. Excellent. So you know, depending on the on the period, like if it's a couple hours, then you will definitely you can see a change in real time. So the, the doctor shift Just that, so you can um, get, and we'll see that next time. You can calculate the masses of the um, of the eclipsing um, star, sorry, the spectroscopic stars uh, from the from the difference in the frequencies. So from the from the Doppler shift. And in the extreme case, uh, you will have um, you can have uh, neutron stars that are orbiting each other and they can be pulsars. So the I guess the, the first evidence uh, of the existence of gravitational waves was from orbiting uh, pulsars because you can calculate their, their mass from their Doppler shift and um, you see the, the period of rotation. And the period of rotation was going down. Uh, I guess it goes down because they are getting rid of the gravitational energy through uh, gravitational waves. And so the uh, detection of gravitational waves at LIGO has been of uh, spectroscopic binaries. So rotating black holes or rotating neutron stars. But things get more complicated because you know, they are so dense that you have to consider um, uh, Einstein's uh, general relativity. But you know, if they're just moving at a few kilometers per second, and they're even if they're massive stars, you're fine with just this. So you can get a lot of uh, information. They the first one. For regular stars, like if the sun, you know, like two uh, stars are the mass of the sun, moving, orbiting at, um, each other, uh, around each other, um, they will not produce enough gravity, enough rotational waves to make any difference. Like you, you cannot observe it. But if you have neutron stars, so the pulsars, and they are orbiting each other very, very fast then um, the, the gravitational waves that they emit is significant. It's actually significant enough that the radius of rotation becomes smaller and smaller until they collide. So otherwise it will not collide. So it's pretty. Mm -hmm. 
that? Yeah, but enough time, what is it, like hundreds of trillions of years? So for, you know, for neutron stars, it happens in billions of years. And that's why we can detect them. Um, but I was reading that they were not sure how to create, you know, how medium-sized black holes were created. So not the size of like a galactic nuclei, not a tiny one. And it seems to be because of uh, these mergers of neutron stars and like, smaller black holes. So they combine you know, they have, like, 120 solar masses or something. So yeah, there will be a homework problem about that. So the, the cool thing is that um, if you had a if you have a charge and you move it, you know, need radiation in the center. If you do the same with a mass, you need rotational radiation. Yes, you are. <laughs> so instead of having like a charged particle, you have a massive particle that the uh, if it is accelerating, then it produces gravitational waves. So yeah, when you walk and everything. <laughs> what what makes it differentiate from magnetic particles? What makes them different? Yeah. At what level? Any level. Well, gravity, it's only attractive. Um, there's no, you know, as far as we know, there's no like negative gravity. Um, you know, more, it's also you know, like much weaker. Uh, I think the range of action is similar. Uh, as in like nuclear force, it has to be very close. Um, both gravity and and um, room interactions are one over R squared. Um, electromagnetism uh, has been combined, and there's a theory that combines the weak force and electromagnetism, or electroweak. And yeah, so in principle, you know, there should be only one force. But if you are a very, it depends on the energy density. So as the energy density decreases, so like when the universe started, there was only one force. Um, and when the density decreases, these four, you know, these forces separate into distinct ones. But it's just from the, the, the temperature, essentially. But why do we? But gravity, gravity cannot be combined with the other two. There is no theory that combines them. Oh, okay. We don't, can't do it. Because gravity seems to be uh, continuous. It's not quantum. Well, quantum gravity is, um, I mean, it's a field of study, but it's not, there's no like theory of quantum gravity. Yeah, and <laughs> funny, I'm like, Imagine maybe you can do you can't relate to the way once you listen. That's a dream. <laughs> That's a dream. Uh, I mean maybe before things, but maybe like maybe that one too. But yeah, you know I um I don't know enough about nuclear physics to Explain how they are combined. I just remember that from my classes. Uh,
<laughs> yep. All right, let's go. I actually don't have a question. question. I'm trying to take it there to see if we could like break the whole course down to see if it's 